Triangles, the life and times of an NFL original team. Season 2, Episode 4, The Stork Era Begins. The 1923 season found unrest in the Young National Football League. As owners and team managers met in August to finalize plans for the fall campaign, many teams struggled financially. The owners moved to cut salaries even as some players held out for better money. Meanwhile in Dayton, a crisis was quietly unfolding. With the November 1922 death of F.B. McNabb, who had been the team's biggest booster in the Triangle Companies and on the Triangle Park Executive Board, support for the Dayton Triangle's football team collapsed. Over the course of several seasons, the team had lost the Triangle Companies nearly $100,000. The new regime, now under General Motors, did not share McNabb's altruism or Nelson Talbot's youthful enthusiasm. In a move that did not become public knowledge for two more years, the executive committee withdrew financial support. To keep the team going, Carl Stork assumed ownership of the Dayton Triangle's NFL franchise. Under immediate pressure to maximize revenue and trim costs, Stork made plans to cut the number of home games at Triangle Park to just three. A September 30th opener against the new Columbus Tigers, a November 4th game against the Toledo Maroons, and what would be the first ever visit from the Chicago Cardinals on November 25th. The rest of the schedule would be on the road. Stork also looked into booking postseason games. With all the changes on the business side, player personnel remained relatively stable. Many of the stalwarts from last year returned for 1923, among them Ken Huffine, Eddie Sauer, Russ Hathaway, and Dutch Thiel. Dave Reese and Lee Fenner were back at the end spots. With Al Mart now gone, Stark named center Hobby Kinderdine as team captain. One of the newcomers was Hobby's fleet-footed younger brother, Walt Babe Kinderdine. Two others were lineman John Beasley and six-foot, 220-pound Al Jolly. Longtime backup Faye Abbott stepped in to become the starting quarterback. The Columbus Tigers were new, but they were no mere expansion team, having sprung up following the demise of the old panhandles. Their star player was former Ohio State All-American running back Pete Stitchcomb. In the run-up to the season opener, former coach Talbot stepped in to help the Triangles get ready. In an attempt to make up for the absence of Mart, Talbot installed a triple-threat offensive scheme. Under this new system, the offense would run all plays out of punt formation. Any of the backfield players could run, pass, or kick on any given play, the idea being to keep the opposing defense guessing. Talbot also created a game plan designed to stop Stitchcomb. Despite all the changes, there was still excitement leading up to the start of the season. For the second straight year, triangle-boosting advertising appeared in the local papers on opening day, Sunday, September 30th. The Columbus game started badly for the triangles. Dutch Steel fumbled the opening kickoff. The Tigers recovered, but the Triangles' defense held on downs at their own two-yard line. Abbott attempted to punt the team out of danger, but shanked the kick, giving Columbus the ball at the Triangles' seven-yard line. The Tigers scored a touchdown from the short field on a quarterback sneak by Sonny Winters, but missed the extra point. Columbus led 6 to nothing at the half. The Triangles were unable to make headway against the Tigers' defense in the third quarter, their big break came in the fourth quarter when Bob Rapp fumbled for Columbus. Dave Reese recovered for the triangles and attempted to advance the ball but was tackled at the Tigers' 15-yard line. Three short runs brought the ball inside the Columbus 10-yard line. With time running out and needing a touchdown, the triangles had to gamble on fourth down. Francis Bacon got open and Abbott hit him for just enough to give Dayton first and goal at the five. They needed another fourth down conversion to get the touchdown on a sneak by Abbott. 
Russell Hathaway kicked the extra point, and the Triangles were able to hold the Tigers off the rest of the way to claim a 7-6 victory. Everyone on the home side went away happy. Everyone, that is, except Carl Stork. He was disappointed in the turnout, and this had a decisive effect on scheduling future home games. The Triangles' road schedule began with a visit to Hammond, Indiana, to face the pros. Hammond, which had failed to score, let alone win last season, had put some effort into upgrading their roster. Most notably, the pros had signed future Hall of Famer Fritz Pollard, who had been a thorn in Dayton's side in 1920 as a member of the Akron pros. Pollard proved fatal to the Triangles once again. On October 7th, the pros exploited an early Francis Bacon fumble of a punt at the Triangle 10-yard line. Hammond and Inky Williams scooped up the fumble and scored the only touchdown on the day. The extra point was good. The Triangles almost salvaged a tie in the last minute of play when Abbott hit Reese for 45 yards. Reese was just short of the goal line when Pollard tackled him, saving the touchdown and preserving the Hammond victory. Time expired before the Triangles could run another play, leaving Dayton on the short end of a 7 to nothing score. The following week saw changes. In a move widely interpreted as a vote of no confidence in Abbott's quarterbacking, Stork signed Earl Bergner. Speculation ensued that Bergner could replace Abbott as soon as the next game at Canton against the defending champion Bulldogs. If Stork's move to sign Bergner was meant to motivate Abbott, it had the opposite effect. Abbott started and went all the way for the triangles, but failed to complete a pass. Canton took advantage of Dayton turnovers and stifling defense to win 30 to nothing. The Triangles managed only two first downs in the defeat. Dayton's offensive woes continued the following week against the Toledo Maroons in a game the Triangles expected to win. Russ Hathaway put Dayton in front with an early field goal, but Abbott threw another costly late interception to Steamer Horning that the Maroons converted into a touchdown by rookie running back Cowboy Hill. Stork benched Abbott late in the game, but to no avail. Toledo won in an upset 6-3, but the margin might have been greater, except for Maroon turnovers. The Triangles now found themselves 1-3 and, and eyeing a tough matchup with the Chicago Cardinals. Facing the greatest adversity in team history to that point, the Triangles went to Chicago's Comiskey Park on October 28th and played their hearts out. It wasn't enough. Dayton simply had no answer for Cardinals left halfback Patty Driscoll. Driscoll accounted for all of Chicago scoring with a touchdown, extra point, and two field goals to lead the Cardinals over the Triangles 13-3. Penalties hampered Dayton, whose only score came on an early field goal by Hathaway. As the Triangles completed their road swing, fans looked forward to a scheduled return game at home against the Toledo Maroons. After their upset win over the Triangles in Toledo, though, the cash-strapped Maroons demanded that Dayton increase their guaranteed share of the gate receipts to 45%. Stork countered with 42.5%. Having reached an impasse, the team appealed to NFL President Joe Carr. NFL rules at the time stipulated the guarantee could be up to 40% plus a privilege, but the rules did not specify what the privilege could or should be. With the two sides unable to come to agreement and no clear rule on the privilege, Carr threw up his hands and ordered the game canceled. At the same time, citing disappointing attendance at the Columbus Tigers opener, Stork announced cancellation of the return game against the Chicago Cardinals that had been scheduled for November 25th at Triangle Park. Before the end of October, the Dayton Triangles' 1923 home season was over. Semi-Pro Club Coors 29 was now the big sports draw on autumn Sundays in Dayton. Stork pushed back against critics of the team's 1-4 and four start. Other than the Canton game, he asserted, the results stemmed from bad breaks. 
He told the papers that he intended to book both the Bears and Cardinals to come to Triangle Park next season. In the meantime, a proposed November 4th matchup against a non-league team from Steubenville, Ohio, fell through. Coming off a week's rest, the Triangles traveled to Cleveland on November 11th to face the Cleveland Indians. They made a much better showing than they had in earlier games, dominating field position, but were unable to score. Hathaway missed a short field goal attempt in the second quarter. The Triangles also blocked a Cleveland punt, and only a heroic effort by the Indians punter averted a Dayton score. The Triangles' best opportunity came in the third quarter, when Babe Kinderdine, in for Francis Bacon, broke through the line on an off-tackle run. With one man to beat to the goal line, he was stopped short. The game ended in a scoreless tie. The next Sunday found the Triangles in Buffalo to play the All-Americans, a former league champion that had recently fought the defending champion Canton Bulldogs to a 3-3 tie. That November 18th, in ankle-deep mud, the game quickly turned into a punting contest. Both running and passing proved futile. The All-Americans got an early field goal that held up thanks to the stellar defense and punt blocking of Swede Youngstrom. Buffalo edged the triangles by a final score of 3 to nothing. With the cancellation of the scheduled Chicago Cardinals game, the weekend of November 24th and 25th was open. Stewart took the opportunity to book a rare Saturday game on the 24th against the non-league Frankfurt Yellow Jackets of Pennsylvania. In another low-scoring affair, the Triangles beat the Yellow Jackets 7-6. to Dayton blocked a punt in the second quarter. Thiel fell on the ball in the end zone for a touchdown, and Hathaway kicked the extra point. Frankfurt returned the favor in the fourth quarter, but their extra point attempt bounced harmlessly off the crossbar, preserving the Triangles' victory. At least one player took the opportunity to moonlight for another team the following day, Sunday, November 25th. Lou Partlow appeared for the Cleveland Indians against Canton. Partlow did not score, though, and Canton won handily by a 46-10 count. The Triangles finished the season with a return game in Columbus against the Tigers, the only league team they had defeated in 1923. Without the strategic coaching and preparation of Bud Talbot, the season ended on a much different note than it had started. Dayton got both their first downs and three points in the first quarter, Hathaway kicking a field goal for the Triangle's only score. From there, Columbus scored 30 unanswered points. As had been the case in the earlier Canton game, the Triangles failed to complete a single forward pass to make matters worse, the defense that had played so well for long stretches of the season failed them. Columbus left halfback Bob Rapp made runs of 60, 50, and 40 yards. In the end, Columbus avenged their season-opening defeat with a resounding 30-3 thrashing of Dayton. The first season of the Stork era ended with two wins, one of which came against non-league competition. Six losses and a tie. The Triangles' 1-6-1 and one league mark put them in a tie for 16th place out of 20 teams in the 1923 season. There were rumors of change as 1923 closed. One proposal surfaced to scale the NFL back to 10 teams within overnight train travel of each other. This would eliminate distant cities such as Green Bay and St. Louis. Meanwhile, the gap between the more and less professional teams continued to widen. For Carl Stork, the challenges of fielding a competitive team in a small market only grew. His players were weekend warriors, and Stork himself burned the candle at both ends, juggling team ownership, coaching, and business management, his duties as a league official, and his full-time job as personnel executive with General Motors in Dayton. Worse, the Triangle's lack of home games apparently did not cause much grief for local football fans. Semi-pro, amateur, and school teams took up the slack. For Stork and the Dayton Triangles, the future looked like an uphill climb. Next time, 
high hopes for a turnaround. Triangles, the life and times of an NFL original team. Written and produced by Bruce Edward Smith. Copyright 2019. All rights reserved. For more episodes and bonus content, go to DaytonTrianglesPodcast.com.